This is a cash flow is contagious presentation of The Mental Attitude That Never Fails, by U.S. Anderson. Over most men hangs the sword of Damocles. They have fallen into the psychological trap of creating their problems by trying to solve them, worrying because they worry, being afraid of fear. There is a capricious quality in our psyche that denies us each object we try to grasp. Our wrong thinking, wrong acting, egoistic nature leads us to pursue things through vain desire, acting and thinking in the small part of our nature, it is inevitable that we be frustrated in our purposes. Ensuring success, the mental attitude that ensures success is one in which the individual turns his work and the results of his work over to the divine without attachment or desire. This psychological absolution from the aims of partial seeing allows him to follow the behest of a master will with perfect equanimity, he will not be dismayed by circuitous routes, he will not be bitter about apparent defeats, he will not rail against obstacles, because he knows that the ends of his actions are in the hands of an omnipotent being which ensures his absolute development and complete success eventually. An enlightened man sees that the purposes of the secret self are the only true purposes, he adopts these as his own, dons the mantle of divine as his true, inmost being, all will his actions take on long-range significance, he understands that there is a secret purpose in the smallest task, that the eventual result of this purpose lies beyond the perception of his conscious mind, there develops within him a towering trust a positive certainty as to eventual victory that makes him irresistible and impregnable in the midst of all action, he cannot be defeated, for defeat is possible only to a being bounded by space and time, and he has taken up his residence in a secret self that is eternal and infinite, he sees that all things are brought to him for his inner perfection, that victory and defeat are merely opposite ends of a scale of sensitivity by which his aspiring soul gradually is able to abdicate from masquerading as a separate, isolated ego and to recognize its absolute unity with the divine. To be undiscouraged and undismayed by whatever turn of fortune is encountered is always a mark of maturity and enlightenment. Such fortitude is possible only to a man who has forsworn desires to be better, to get more, to have power, or any other of the egoistic shortcomings that mark the individual at war with his fellows. The vital and animalistic nature hungers always for the fruits of its labor, and when these are denied, it becomes disconsolate, loses faith, may even give up altogether. Whoever is bound to his animalistic nature is bound also to constant hungering for the fruits of his labor, and in consequence takes up his tasks under a delusion that blinds him to the possibilities for success. Selfish striving for gain defeats enterprise at the outset because it is based upon the false belief that one manifestation of the divine is innately better than another and therefore more deserving of reward. Such psychological misapprehension is based on partiality, sees a world of multitudinous and separate things to be conquered and achieve dominion over, the separate surface self never achieves dominion over anything, even over its own nature, it did not spring itself into being, it cannot stay itself from eventual oblivion, its growth and development are entirely reactionary, and all things lie outside the scope of its effectuality. Effective Guide to Living In almost everyone, however, the surface self achieves the illusion that it is able effectively to influence life. In consequence, through the years that his physical body flourishes, a man is mentally and spiritually bound to a delusion about who he is and where he came from and what his relationship to the world is. His lack of effectiveness in life, his failure to grow mentally and spiritually, his gradual dissolution into cynicism, into disenchantment with the material world, he seldom attributes to a psychologically wrong viewpoint but generally feels he hasn't beat the game because he hasn't arrived at the pinnacle of material success he envisaged as a youth, even more revealing are ego strivers who achieve their goals, the mountain they climb so laboriously overlooks a barren landscape. When they stand upon the highest spot and look out over the bleak vista, 
their souls are seized in the vice-like grip of fear, and they turn their eyes to the earth and never look skyward again. Our cities and nations are populated with people who cannot stand to look into their souls because they never have discovered who they truly are. Infinity and eternity appall them by dwarfing the ego. What is needed most of all is an effective guide to living, a humanistic relationship between the individual and his creating source, so that each man is able to see with absolute clarity and perfect equanimity that his life not only is part of the divine plan for the development of consciousness in the universe but that he himself is both mentally and spiritually unified with that master spirit whose field of unfoldment the world is. Such spiritual illumination allows a man to put his life and his works in the hands of the divine, with complete assurance that both will be used for the best purpose. Once this psychological dispossession of personal effort and personal victory has been accomplished, the individual never again suffers defeat. Apparent defeat becomes only a turning place in the road, all detours merge into one triumphal march to victory become part of that plan by which eventual success is assured. When the revelation comes to a man that the divine is working through him, all his labor takes on a highly charged spiritual significance alongside which material rewards pale. Such a man no longer works for money, no longer works for success, but only for the expression of that mind and consciousness within him which he now knows to be the supreme manifesting upon the earth. He does the work of the secret self and never of his surface self. He subjugates the surface self to a master spirit that uses it as a tool for the effectuation of the divine purpose in the world. The faith that grows out of this knowledge sustains him under the most fierce, adverse pressure. Something higher than heart or intellect upholds him through the longest detours and the blindest groping. His egoistic self has found that supreme master and highest philosophy by which it not only understands itself and its place and purpose in the world but also is admitted to a secret place of light and peace and understanding. In the heart of the enlightened man is the hidden knowledge that he is never at the mercy of immediate appearances, that he has within him the power to change all through his identification with the divine, through his knowledge that the mind in him is the mind in all others. Perfect knowing and imperfect seeing, this giving over of oneself and assuming another is far more than just an eerie psychological switch of viewpoint. The awakened man dies in one small part of his nature in order to be reborn in a larger and wider consciousness, to the onlook of the change may be imperceptible. He may do the same work, live in the same manner, forsake neither friends nor fun but all actions now will be unified by spiritual awareness, so that there emanates from him an inner joy, an absolute acceptance of life, he may rise to a position of prominence in the world or he may not, it is indifferent to him, he serves not the causes of men, only the will and purpose of the divine, we are here to see what we can add to, not to see what we can get from, life, wrote William Osler. In the enlightened man the egoistic nature has been so far withdrawn from the frontal part of personality that his impression upon others is one of constant giving, never of taking, he becomes a horn of plenty through which the divine pours its infinite resource, to whomever he contacts there comes a sense of love and understanding and security, descending through him into the other from the secret self. Those whose consciousness is focused in the surface self live within narrow horizons of awareness, are puppets driven by sensation. The world makes itself known to them through the tiny windows of their senses, and they react to it, never exert a mental or spiritual influence upon it. Their failures are failures of imperfect seeing. They see neither who they are nor what the true nature of a situation is. Consequently their actions are always based upon partial knowledge. A sufficient number of failures stemming from this imperfect working completely defeats the individual, and his frustration is announced through physical ailments of the body. Emotional blockages and repressions inhibit circulation in certain areas of the body, and disease and malfunction set in. Repressed hostility, aggression, insecurity, 
and fear are root causes of arthritis, heart disease, arterial sclerosis, cancer, ulcer. A society that demands conformity of its members is bound to frustrate a large number of them, and this manifests itself as a gradual rise in physical infirmity, since it is patently impossible for the individual to alter the social system under which he lives. Solution of the dilemma must provide spiritual freedom while allowing for physical conformity, arriving at the realization that the divine dwells in you just as you dwell in the divine dissolves the cares and frustration of the egoistic nature. Once you have been able to identify yourself with the master spirit of eternity it becomes possible to view existence on a long-term basis, to detach yourself from physical goals. Failure is a state of mind, existence is essentially a fight, man is tested in the crucible of conflict from cradle to grave, and the time of his most severe testing is the time of his greatest growth, nature is not interested in winners, all too often victory is a signal for cessation of effort, nature is interested in growth, and growth is possible only to one constantly at work expanding his abilities and talents. In any line of endeavor the man who has it made is going downhill, our waistlines stay trim and our minds alert when we are kept at our labors through necessity, our surface selves often find in victory or gain the opportunity to indulge sensation, and we are caught in a trap from which we may never emerge as aspiring individuals again, Havelock Ellis wrote, conquest brings self-conceit and intolerance. The reckless inflation and dissipation of energies, defeat brings prudence and concentration, it ennobles and fortifies, defeat, of course, is never a fact unless it is accepted as final, the man who realizes that all growth possibilities are within him never accepts defeat, he knows that he can do much better than he thus far has shown, for he has a secret pipeline into the source of all energy and talent. Failure is a state of mind and never a physical fact. We try to accomplish something and if results don't come our way within a certain period of time we often throw up our hands and say we can't do it. If this psychological abdication from trying is done without a cessation of physical effort, we may find that suddenly we are getting results, for unconsciously we have turned our works and actions over to the secret self and they have become effective. But if the individual ceases to make any further physical effort, then the work will never be done for the man has turned his back on it. Boldness, each of us best fulfills himself and the purposes of nature when he performs the task of torchbearer in some area of his activities. Boldness engenders its own success through liberating energies repressed by inhibition. If a man finds within himself the courage to go out on a limb, it will never break under his weight, will sustain him no matter how fragile it appears, and he will see from his new vantage point an entirely different world, between the timid and the brave is but a single step, and that is the first one, wild animals attack the prey that runs away but stand stock still and are intimidated by any that faces them, if a man will find within himself the spiritual resource to make his first step toward danger instead of away from it, he will find that danger disappears, but if he gives in to the impulse of fear and makes his initial step away from danger, life will chase after him, surely devour him. Fear engenders fear, the first step away from danger turns into a trot, then a shambling run, then a panic-stricken dash, and the innocuous cur that pursues us is now a fancied monster, similarly courage engenders courage, the first step toward danger allows us to see our antagonist clearly, we examine his face and behold that it is not nearly so threatening as we imagined, we begin to see ways and means of coping with him, and just because we've confronted him head on, he stops his aggressive action toward us and considers whether we ourselves might not pose some danger to him. This is true of events as well as living things. A psychological aura emanates from events as from people. If something seems to threaten us, then it surely will pursue us if we run away, but if we advance upon it boldly, 
it stops its movement toward us, it hangs back to reconsider, eventually yields, nothing stands before continued effort and nothing can resist the man who persists in the face of all discouragement. The mental attitude that never fails is one in which the individual dispossesses himself of the goal-seeking ego and lodges his psyche firmly in a consciousness of the divine, viewing his own life as an opportunity for emergence of the master spirit, regarding the work that he does as being the work of the secret self. Perseverance Everything great is accomplished by men whose perseverance transcends mere human endurance. Galileo at his telescope, Newton beneath his apple tree, Einstein in his laboratory, Columbus on his ship, all are examples of illumination following a period of prolonged perseverance. No man performing at the behest of egoistic desire could possibly have accomplished the feats of these enlightened pioneers, long before illumination arrived, he would cease his searching and go on to other fields. The divine uses the discoverer and the creator each for the purpose for which he is best suited, such men cannot fail for they are doing the work for which they were intended at birth, in consequence, their lives are completely absorbed in their tasks, so that the work is inseparable from the man, is in some kind of mystic sense the man spun out in space and time and perpetuated as a creative fact. When that psychological turnabout is made by which the individual life is surrendered to the secret self, there enters into the person an unearthly determination that impels him to perform his work in the face of all odds. In the teeth of the bleakest appearances, he takes his cue from a light within, and he is able to alter the psychological aura of things by bringing into the midst of events his own positive determination and absolute dedication to the accomplishment of his tasks. His impact upon events is not brought about through vain desires or selfish goals, only because he is doing those tasks that are natural to him. Fear of failure is a deterrent to action in all those entrapped in ego consciousness. The surface self does not possess that sense of equality necessary to the undertaking of perilous tasks. It is concerned always with appearances and it cannot bring itself to undertake an adventuresome action because if such action comes off disastrously or comically it is made to appear incapable or a fool. Millions of people are afraid to try because they are afraid to fail, and such inhibition keeps them from realizing all but the tiniest fraction of their capabilities. This short-sighted focusing of consciousness in the surface self keeps the individual's attention upon transitory goals. He undertakes to sing a song, for example, not because a song in him must be sung but because he wants the attention and admiration of others. With this false viewpoint, it is even difficult for him to bring himself to get up before his audience, for he carries within a picture of the shame and defeat he will feel if his attempt to win admiration results instead in ridicule. The song therefore does not get sung, and if sung, sung poorly. The individual has not become the thing he is doing but is only using it for the satisfaction of his surface nature. Don't be afraid to fail. The mental attitude that never fails is one that is not afraid to fail. One must be willing to accept the conditions that follow failure before he has any chance of attempting a new enterprise. If it be such a simple thing as diving off a board into a swimming pool, one must be willing to accept the pain attendant upon a belly flop before he is able to muster the determination to dive. Once fear is gone, he will not belly flop, his dive will be swift and clean. He performs it because it is in him, and it performs him as much as he performs it. To get the surface self out of the way and allow the psyche to be possessed by master spirit allows the individual to undertake his tasks without the slightest fear of failure because he not only has a sense of equality toward others but knows that a power greater than he is guiding his steps in the best possible manner. We need to realize that everything is the result of change that there is nothing permanent in the entire world except that secret self from which we have sprung. This has been a presentation of Cash Flow is Contagious. As your consciousness grows, your cash flows.